caretaker of the house. He's six, um, and he's he rules the other two. We have uh, one uh, seven-year-old golden golden retriever named named Indiana. He's like 105 pounds. Great. And then we got a new puppy. He's six. she's uh, I think seven, 16 weeks. She's not quite six months yet. It's like, like, anyway, he's young. Her name's Espen, after much debate, which is Swedish for divine bear, because she is part St. Bernard and part Great Pyrenees. Um, she'll, she weighs about 40 plus pounds. She'll be about 130 when she gets full grown. And one thing about this puppy, and I remember about, about this when we first got Indiana when he was a puppy, it's worse than a baby. <laughs> Holy mackerel. In fact, I, I had to remind my wife and my son that the, the week that in human years, this dog is two and a half years old. <laughs> what do two and a half year olds do? <laughs> Eat. <laughs> Get rid of the food. <laughs> and thinks everything belongs to them and wants all the attention. <laughs> and destroys the, the furniture and the pillows and the socks and knocks over dishes and water and as if the house belongs to them. It's all about them, right? Three in the morning. Like, oh good just stop. Because of course it's not about the dog, it's all about me. So when you have these conflicting wills puppy thinks it's, it's all about her and I'm like I want to sleep it's all about me what happens you forget you're a baby and when you're young in age or young in your faith we behave in ways that reflect that sometimes it takes some of us longer to mature than others depending on who we are what we've done where we live others longer but Eventually, as we walk our faith, we come to a realization that it's not about me. It's about someone else. We left off two weeks ago um, with the story of Exodus. Uh, and in this story, we left off that we, we recap briefly that the Israelites had found themselves in a pretty bad situation. They were the guests of, of Pharaoh, the king of the most powerful nation back, uh, which, is, which, which, which was um, uh, Egypt uh, hundreds of years ago, well, thousands of years ago. Time passed. And Joseph passed, and his family passed, and the Egyptians and leaders forgot about their history, about who the Israelites were. And the Israelites grew from a, a, a group of 70 plus to a group of a million or more. And so, if you were a leader of a country, you had a million plus people living in your country, what are some of the thoughts that you have? Well, Pharaoh is like, if these people revolt and join our, our enemies, we're, we're done. So they enslaved them and put them into forced labor. They still weren't, that still wasn't good enough. They wanted to make sure that, that, that no more warriors would be born. So they, Pharaoh ordered all of the Hebrew boys to be killed to ensure that they were under control. Well, two weeks ago we found out that here was Israel. If you remember our Old Testament promise that God gave to Abram, to Abraham, that his descendants would be as numerous as the sand and stars. He would have his own nation, his own people. And here is Israel poised. They were saved because of Joseph and Egypt, but fast, fast forward 400 years, now they're slaves again. Where is God? What's happening? In chapter 2, Moses was born. The hero who would save his people, right? Well, we fast forward now to part 2. Moses is about 40 years old. He was raised in Pharaoh's court, in Pharaoh's house, which means he got the best education, reasoning, rhetoric, reading, math, uh, logic, languages. He got the best that there was for 40 years. And he knew, though, that he was 
a um, Hebrew, so he, he knew where, where he was from, at least uh, his ethnicity. Over the course, at some point, this day came where he saw the Egyptians, one Egyptian, beating a Hebrew man. And a sense of justice comes out. Why there? I'm not sure. So what's he do? He looks both ways. And he kills the Egyptian guard. And buries his body in the sand. The next day he comes out to two Hebrew men fighting. Brothers, what are you doing? Why are you fighting each other? And what are their response? Who are you? Who made you prince over us? Are you going to kill us like you killed that e Egyptian too? Maybe a little bit of tension there because they probably knew that he is also a Hebrew, but he has it much better than them. Perhaps they even turned him in. Who knows? He gets scared. Pharaoh and they did find out about Moses' act. So what? And the penalty of murder is death. So he flees to the neighboring. Uh, land of Midian and he rests by a well. This is where his third act of justice comes. He took action against the guard. He took action against his fellow Hebrews. He goes to a well and sees a shepherdess, several of them, trying to, to water their flocks of goats, probably. When the shepherds there were harassing them and driving them off. So he gets up, he shoes them away, he takes care of her flock, their flocks for, for them, and they're happy. They go back to their father. Hey, this is what this man did. Well, where is he? He's back. They go get him. So they go back and they get Moses, bring him to Jethro, the priest of Midian. And as a reward, what does Jethro do? <laughs> Here's my daughter. Take her for as your wife. How it happened back then. Ellie, where are you? What do you think? Want to marry a shepherd? I know his name. <laughs> Won't go there. We pick up then what happens. Now, how many years was Moses in the court of Pharaoh, roughly? Do you remember? About 40 years old. He was 40. He flees the Midian. We turn to chapter 3 of Exodus beginning with verse 1. You guys know how many years he was in Midian? Forty. Which makes him how old now? Eighty. All those, and we'll get more to this next week too. Forty years in the house of Pharaoh was preparation, education, knowing Egypt inside and outside, knowing how things operate, getting educated. Forty years in Midian as a shepherd, as a husband, as a dad. You had the white collar, you had the blue collar for 40 years, 40 years. Now, it's time. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that the, the, the bush was on fire. It did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight while the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses! Moses! And Moses said, Here I am! Don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of, uh, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So, 
I have come down to rescue them from the land, the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now we'll pause there for a moment. How many years, how old is Moses here? 80. 40 years in Pharaoh's court. Pretty pampered life, but saw his, his people being oppressed. Finally took action and fled out of fear. 40 years now as a shepherd in Midian. And now we have here God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is me. I, I have finally, I have seen them, heard them. I'm going to act. I'm going to save them. Moses maybe be thinking what? Maybe be thinking, kind of English is that. Moses is thinking maybe what? It's all speculation, but oh, all right, God. Uh, finally, yes. How are you going to do it? Verse 10. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people Israelites out of Egypt. And thus begins the dialogue with Moses and his God. How many here have, have you argued with God? Oh, I have. How many have won? <laughs> How many think you win? <laughs> So he argues. I'm sure Moses, um, there is one person that is that's constant throughout history. That it, it doesn't matter if you're in America or Africa or Europe or South America, or no matter what nationality or what, even what language you speak, there is one person that's constant in every group of people. What's that person's name? First and last name. And he has a cousin too. Somebody else? Anybody else? Who will do it? Who will I send? Oh, some, send somebody else. Or anybody else. But not me. So Moses gives a string of excuses, reasons to him. First one in chapter 3, verse 11. Who am I? Who am I to go to, to the king of the most powerful nation in the world and tell him what to do? Who am I? How many of you have perhaps asked that same question about yourself? Who am I? What can I do? Now, Moses was trained. He was educated too. But still... Uh, his focus was on who? On himself. God's response, verse 12, and God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you worship God on this mountain. You see, it isn't about you. It's about God. Isn't it about your, all of your preparation and all of your talents and giftings? It's about what I am going to do through you and even despite of you. Moses focused on the wrong person. So what does Moses then say? All right, God, I'm sold. I'll go. No. In verse 13, he asks the question, who are you? If they ask me who sends me, what will I tell them? So remember, what was Moses' first response when God called, called him? Moses, Moses, what did he say? Here I am. What was his first e excuse? Who am I? It goes from I am here to who am I? To now who are you? What does God say? Verses 14 through 15. 
God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of, the, of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Now, a little sidebar here. In most English Bibles, you have the word Lord, L-O-R-D. And if those letters are all capital, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is uh, the word Yahweh in Hebrew. That's the Lord's proper name. Yahweh. If in your English Bibles it has a capital L with all lowercases O-R-D, that's usually the Hebrew word for Adonai, which means Lord or Master. So whenever you see all caps, it's his proper name is, is being used, Yahweh, which is a, der, a derivative from the word to, to be, used in the first person, I am. I could have a whole month-long class on just this word, on his name. It is a verb. I am. Who sent me? I am sent you. Who's it about? It's about me because I am with you. Or I am that I am. Or I will be what I will be. God here says, I am the God, I'm not just of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of you. And my name is I am. So does Moses give in then? I'll go willingly? Third excuse. He says, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? In verse 4 of chapter 1, God responds by, uh, in chapter 4, of verses 2 through 9. Next one, please. Jim, one more. Thank you. Actions are louder than words. He gives a series of three signs. One about turning a staff in the end of a snake. One about putting a, a hand into his robe, pouring that and it turns into a, a d diseased hand only to be healed again. And the third one is turning water into blood as a sign that God sent him to his people. I won't spend too much time on this because, again, for the sake of time. But God was saying, I, I will provide signs for you, Moses. Don't worry about it. It's about me, it's about me and not about you. So Moses then gives in and says, I'll go, right? No. Verse 10 of chapter 4, I'm not good enough, God. I can't speak well. I can't put, I'm, I'm slow of tongue. Now, where was Moses educated? In Pharaoh's court. It taught rhetoric, reason, argumentation. He knew his stuff. Perhaps he didn't think he was that good. Or perhaps he had a, a, uh, a speech impediment, which some commentators think. But he thought, I am not good enough. I can't do it. This, this story of Moses is my story, not all of it, but one that, that I re relate to the most in my life. Um, when I was, and some of you may, may know this already, um, I do have uh, a, uh, a speech impediment, and I hate talking about it. It annoys the snot out of me. Um, when I was in like first grade, uh, I could barely say words with F's or S's or ST's, um, and I just could not get them out. And it got worse throughout like um, grade school. Uh, obviously, plus I was also a little bit overweight, so you know, kids being kids, people being people, they made fun of you with you know, how you speak, how you look, and it shapes you. I don't wish that on anybody, but it shapes you to care about how others talk, how they feel, and you can be more uh, empathetic to people. I hated giving oral reports for obvious reasons. But God has a sense of humor. 
Never in my million years would I have thought that I would, my job would be speaking publicly. And guess what I do? So if, if you notice sometimes that I speak lowly or I stir some things, those are just tools that I use to be able to speak somewhat clearly. I'm not trying to, to talk softly, but those are things I have learned subconsciously too to, to talk, to communicate. But God's funny. He prepped Moses for how many years in Egypt? 40. Prepped Moses for how many years in Midian? 40. Yet he chose an area to use Moses to go to the most powerful person in the world at that point. And uses one of the things that Moses is hated to do the most. So there is a thing about spiritual gifts that you should be gifted and minister in your giftings. And on this side, God's laughing. <laughs> because I'm going to use you because you can't speak well. And guess what? I'm going to do it because then you'll know it's me. And I wrestle with that still. Trying to do things on my own without God's power. But I'm here to tell you that don't allow your fears. You know that the number one fear in this country is what? Public speaking. Even more than death. That's kind of weird. Don't allow your fears to stop you. And don't allow your pride to stop you. I wish the times that I could speak like James Earl Jones. You know, like the Darth Vader voice. And he's very... But guess what? James Earl Jones is also a stutterer. And he's learned to also control that. You can conquer your fears if you don't allow it to stop you. So, Moses said in verse 10, I'm not good enough. What does God say? Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go! I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But does he do it then? Now we get to the crux of the issue. The last layer of the reason why Moses didn't want to do it. Verse 13. Send someone else. Well, I don't want to do it. I just don't want to do it. What does God do? As God and as a parent, what do you do? Boy! Don't make me get that stick out. <laughs> Boy! Verse 14. The Lord's anger burned. He was mad against Moses. And he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? Now, if you only go by the Exodus story from uh, the, the movie with um, Charlton Heston, you, you, you won't get this, but the biblical narrative is very clear that God even now met Moses halfway and let his brother Aaron speak for him. Now, what's that say about God? He's patient. He puts up with us. Thank him. <laughs> because he loves us and he has a plan for us. See, Moses' excuses were what? Who am I? But who are you? What if they, they don't believe in me? Listen, what if I'm not good enough to send someone else? What excuses do we use? When God tugs on your heart or convicts you, I don't have time, I'm not good enough, I'm not educated enough, I'm too old, he's 80 guys, I'm too young. Some observations. 
God's timing is not our timing. How many years was Israel in Egypt after, after Joseph to Moses? About 400 years. Moses was preparing for 40 years in Egypt, for 40 years in Midian, to finally do his job. And Moses, and we'll get to this in some weeks, he died at, at what age? For an extra bonus. 120 years old. So he was two-thirds through his life when his main calling began. Not that he and, I, and we don't have things to do now. But perhaps you're testing that whatever you're going through is sharpening you. To allow you to be the agent of God he wants you to be. Wherever he sends you. Number two, God prepares his people for his service. Like he did for Moses. But number three, he has a sense of humor. <laughs> Who was Moses relying on? Himself. Who are you relying on? To pull you through, to give you strength, to give you energy, to be a light in a world that's full of darkness. Who are you relying on? What's stopping you? Number four, it's all about focus. Do you focus on your problems? Do you focus on your deficiencies? Things you can't do well? Do you go in your mirror at home and look at the mirror and count how many wrinkles you've formed from last week? Or how many pimples you see? Or how, you know, little weight you could lose in the face or the sides here? You know, or do you go and go, ooh, you know, and try and pose? And do you like what you see? If you're like most people, the answer is no, you don't. Do you think that's what God sees? Church, we need to focus on what's important. Not on the superficial. Because life is short. So, what about you? What are you scared of doing? What are, what's stopping you from being all that God has made you to be? What are you focusing on too much? Are, are these excuses your excuses? But who am I? I should do that. Lord, if you're God, then how come you took 400 years to come to your people? Yeah, where were you? He was there. He just has his reasons that I don't know. What if they don't listen? What if they, 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 they don't believe me? I'm not good enough. Lord, just send someone else. And my challenge to you is what does God want you to do? No matter what fears you may have, what you're used to, what inconvenience it may be, perhaps you've waited a long time and yet fear has stopped you. What can you do practically to let God reign in you and have control. What does God want you to do?